Upon conquering the maze of trees and ornery Pokemon of Route 1 and Adventuring Forest last time, we reached the mouth of this labyrinth. You may have noticed during our travels through the overgrown puzzle that there was a track other than the White Forest playing. That track was the accompaniment for Route 1 and earlier releases of Reborn, being Black and White's Entralink, the remix version 2 that Glitchex City created. It's extremely catchy and very fun, though I can bet the reason it was changed was because you are reasonably going to spend a long time in that area, and if the song is too catchy, it starts to get annoying. It's definitely good design to put something that hooks you less if you're going to hear it for longer, so that it doesn't overshadow the experience. This may all be completely wrong, and probably is, and this is not to say that White Forest is a lesser song. Just an observation I like to make while I could still talk about the tracks that changed. As of this episode, there aren't any more changes to the music throughout releases that I'm aware of. Maybe we'll revisit this concept in later episodes, but this is the last one I have for you. Here we are in Van Hanen Labyrinth, which is actually kind of a funny meta joke. You just got done going through the tangled maze that was Adventuring Forest. Now do this hedge maze. It will take you some time to find a way through, especially once you realize there are item finder items waiting at dead ends as consolation prizes. There's one visible item you can find before reaching the end. This field effect readout. I'm not talking about that yet. If I could avoid it forever, I would. After bumping into hedge walls for 10 minutes, you'll finally reach the conclusion of the maze and reach a castle. That, of course, being Van Hanen Castle. Enter, and be immediately greeted by Uh who will welcome you as a gym challenger and ask you to step inside. As you do, you'll find the blonde-haired girl in black and white dress waiting beside an Umbreon, who we learn upon petting it is named Cheshire. Two evolutions petted, six more to go. Talking to the girl, she says her master will arrive soon, and by soon, she means at this very moment, wearing a very strange hat. What are you wearing, a Millennium item? Beside him is a Gardevoir. And if you were listening to the news throughout the series so far, then you would know this is not just any Gardevoir. The TV star Gossip Gardevoir finally appears in person, which of course means that Pyramid Head there is Radimus. This should then clue you in on who the blonde girl is, who Radimus introduces as his daughter Luna, who calls herself the castle's maid. So that's continuing, eh? Meanwhile, we need not introduce ourselves, as Gardevoir quickly runs down the escapades we've been in, knowing not only that it was us who jailbroke the orphanage, but that we are a proud member of Team Magma. Much more resourceful than she lets on, almost scary. Radimus then guesses correctly that we have arrived to obtain the next badge, to which he then asks the two ladies to step out for a moment. However, he speaks not of our gym battle, but of Luna, or more accurately, her father. Just like Sarah, Radimus tells us that Luna is not actually his daughter, that he is playing the same routine as the Ice Gym Leader. He says he knows this for certain because of Luna's emerald brooch. Uh, why does that matter? But Radimus goes on, saying he agreed to this strange situation since he has no family anymore, and that Luna and Gardevoir quickly became good friends. He then turns the conversation to L, saying that he has come to attempt to take Luna back. Radimus assures that he will protect Luna from him. At this point though, Luna peeks in to inform Radimus of another guest. It's Kane. It turns out that Kane is continuing his league challenge, even though, you know, the whole Aya thing. Whatever, he tells us that he's getting back in the saddle on this after finally catching up with Heather, saying she wasn't happy about him finding her, apparently. But he says how she was adopted by someone in Amatrine City named Bla- Mmm. Bla- Mmm. Fuck it, moving on. Radimus says there is only one gym for the two challengers, and after dismissing Kane's idea of me and him battling Radimus and both getting a badge, hey, I'm hella down for that, you have no idea, Kane then suggests I battle him to see who fights Radimus first. Oh no, it's happening right now, isn't it? Alright, fine, let's just get this over with and- Oh no! I have no choice. Kane not only ambushes me with a rival battle, but he does so on one of the worst fields in the game. It's time to introduce the next field effect, a killing field, chessboard. Chess. 
chessboard. A thankfully rare field effect, but all that means is that nearly all of the major battles that use it will decimate you, because your opponent will be so much better at exploiting it than you. First, let's go over the pieces. Yeah, you see that menu that says Pokemon? Nah, that's now chess pieces. Each one of the chess pieces does different things, and each one can turn around a battle in an instant, usually against you, but we'll get to that. First piece is the pawn. The Pokemon that is chosen to be a pawn is simple. It's any of them that are sent out in the first turn of battle. A pawn gains the effect of Focus Sash. It's far more irritating than you realize. Next comes the Rook. More than one Pokemon in your team can be a Rook. The criteria is that Pokemon must have its highest stat be either Defense or Special Defense. If so, then upon switching in, a Rook gains one stage of both defenses. Then you have the Bishop. Same premise as the Rook, except for attack. After that comes the Knight, which has the condition that the Pokemon's speed stat must be highest. If so, then damage dealt by a Knight will be tripled against the Queen and gains 25% power if it hits both opponents in a doubles match. Of Rook, Bishop, and Knight, any number of Pokemon in your party can be these roles if they aren't overridden by other certain roles. Those roles are Pawn, Queen, and King. Now for the Queen. As you might expect, the Queen is your ace, literally. The last Pokemon in your party is the Queen and gains 50% power to all of its attacks and gains one stage of both defenses. You can obviously only have one, and it will override everything, including the final piece. That piece is the King. The Pokemon in your party with the lowest HP, or one that is holding a King's Rock, will become your singular King. All of the moves used by the King have their priority increased by one. Hmm. So there you have it. That's just the basic rules of this field. Is your head already spinning? Believe me, it won't ever stop. I'll get to some more strategy of this headache field, but first, let's go over the rest of the changes. Queenly Majesty, remember Zarina? Gives a 50% power boost to all moves used by that Zarina. These moves gain a 50% boost and a rock secondary type. If the target has Oblivious, Simple, Unaware, or Klutz, then the move is 100% stronger. If the target has Adaptability, Synchronize, Anticipation, or Telepathy, it does half of its normal damage. These moves gain a 50% boost only. Calm Mind raises special attack and special defense by two stages. Gen 1 Amnesia's back again. Nasty Plot raises special attack by three stages. King Shield will block any move, including status moves, and contact moves that are blocked will now lower both attacks by two stages. Ow. Trick Room lasts for eight turns. Nature Power becomes Ancient Power. Camouflage is Psychic. Secret Power may lower defense by one stage. A Synthetic Seed used by a Pokemon will raise special attack by one stage and give Magic Coat. Now, how in the hell do you navigate this mess? Let me start by saying, if you know a good way, you're probably one of those people that plays chess and thinks ahead like 15 turns. Me? I suck at chess, and this is one of my most hated fields. If a battle starts on chess and I wasn't aware it would, that's an instant reset. The makeup of your team will make it so that you may not even have one of each type of piece. Most likely you'll have more than one bishop, while potentially having no knights at all. In my older files, it was very common for me to have three bishops, and if not, then two with a rook. You have some choice when it comes to controlling which role a Pokemon gets. First, like I mentioned, the first and last spots of your party for certain roles. This allows you to force a Pokemon that may not fit their role well into either being a pawn or a queen. Typically, a Pokemon having high attack stats goes well in the queen slot, especially if you have more than one bishop already. Pokemon, meanwhile, that have important setup moves are obviously well suited to be a pawn, because you will, or should be, guaranteed to get one move off before fainting. If you outspeed, you can get two, of course. What these two roles also do is allow you to give the Pokemon in your party with the second or third lowest HP the King roll, as long as you relegate first and second lowest into the Pawn and Queen slots. In a double battle, you can get the fourth lowest to be a King, since your first two will be Pawns. So, if you have a Pokemon that you know has moves you want to have priority, but is second or third in succession, 
put the others in the first and last slots. As for strategy, having the buffed prio moves will be a boon, especially fake out on a pawn, thereby taking away their sturdy and their first attack, leaving your sturdy intact for a setup move or a knockout. Obviously avoid having Pokemon with these four abilities, and try to get these four if possible. Using your ability capsules would be a good idea. For the pieces themselves, either take the tempo by using your pawn to knock out theirs first, or set up hard with a rook or queen using the defensive stats to overwhelm. Use the king to break through bad situations such as when their queen hits the board. I could try to give you more tips here, but it's going to come down to a turn-by-turn -turn basis. You're just going to need to feel it out, and this is what makes Reborn so difficult. Fields like this one, and many others coming, create such a lopsided battle that it will be nearly impossible to formulate a succinct, consistent strategy even after dozens of attempts. For Chessboard itself, the depth of strategy you can reach on this field is deserved for the game it draws from. As for difficulty, this is one of the fields that will break you in half with glee but it's rare enough that it will only be a black and white brick wall a few times. Depth, 10. Difficulty, 8. By the way, you can just use Stomping Tantrum and blow up the chessboard. Yeah, that's possible, in case you really don't want to fight Radimus the intended way. Now you know the reason I caught that Mankey in Episode 2. Reborn is going to force-feed me a game of chess right now against Kane who leads with Rainbow Muck to my Greninja. Hey, remember that thing I said I'd do where I reset on the first turn when I wasn't expecting a battle on chessboard? Yeah, this team is... not the team for this. And where is my reset counter? Greninja is my pawn, which might have merit since a multi-hit move is the counter to Sturdy, but that's Muck again. Special defense for days. I decide to use Smokescreen first turn, which gets the Muck to whiff his power-up punch, thank god, I was weak to fighting already, then change to Normal to still be weak. I use Shuriken to see what kind of damage I can deal, which is better than I expected, as I'm hit with another power-up punch for minimal damage. I thought this was going alright after the next Shuriken, until Gunk Shot hit me. Need a big Shuriken... No. Into the nearly dead Muck, I send my King, Vanillux. This lets me do an easy priority freeze-dry to kill it. Next up is Fire Ghost Rook Marowak. So I'll send Fire Dark Bishop Houndoom. I go for foul play since Marowak's attack stat is probably better than Houndoom, but only do half. That's when the Marowak decides it has already had enough of this fucking game and stomping tantrums the board. This unfortunately knocks out my Houndoom, but the chessboard is gone. That may be for the best. It's really unfortunate that Greninja is already fainted. My team has nearly nothing to deal with Marowak, but I go into Hariyama since he has knockoff. My fighter actually outspeeds the Marowak to knock it out easily, but it's time once again for the hell that is Primarina. I have a couple options for it, which is first Jump Pluff. Unfortunately, it has no attacking grass moves, but it puts the Primarina to sleep immediately. Next turn though, after sowing the seeds of Leech, Primarina capitalizes on my hail and Blizzard's Jump Pluff. Well, I have an Ice Type too, one that can actually hurt Primarina pretty well. Going into Vanillux and Freeze Drying does almost enough, but I have to eat a Moon Blast before Hail hits the Primarina on the head and knocks it out. Now Kane is sending out Nidoking, which is another thing I have very little for. Vanillux isn't going to outspeed, and taking another hit is asking for trouble. Instead, I decide that Hariyama can do this with his high remaining health. A Guts Fake Out does a huge chunk. But once again, Needle King is not holding anything. If he was, Knock Off would kill it! Kane, you gave your Marowak an item. You gave your Muck an item. Put an item in your Ace's hands! Because of this, its Poison Jab is more than able to put away Hariyama first but I realize that I can kill it if I were to use another fake out. My level 49 Heracross shouldn't have been in this fight, so I switch her in to Sacrifice, though she proves that even at that level she can take a hit. She can't outspeed though. Sorry Heracross. Back to Hariyama, I finish off the Needle King with another big handed fake out. But then the worst thing possible is coming out next. Mimikyu. You've gotta be kidding me. When I have this team left? Worse, it has Shadow Sneak, 
so Hariyama cannot get its disguise off. During this fight, I got pissed that Hale ended at that moment, but I realize afterwards that it doesn't matter. Weather doesn't break the disguise. As such, I'm a total sitting duck against the Mimikyu. Damn it, Kane, why is your team so annoying? Would have been better if my team was at full capacity. I replaced my unprepared Heracross with Mawile and Greninja with Meowstic. I then put Hariyama up front and do the entire cutscene over again. Back in it, Kane's muck starts out by losing a third of its life to Fake Out. Knockoff gets rid of the Black Sludge but does piddly damage otherwise, while Gunk Shot puts Hariyama right into red. A close combat pummels the pile into a more fist imprinted pile and we knock it out. Guess who's next? Okay, that's hard to guess because I hate half of Kane's team. It's Mimikyu. Man, that sucks so much. Fake Out obviously won't work, so it gets to have a free hit, like Kane has two pawns. Not only that, but it's also Kane's king, so it has priority on all of its moves. I send out Houndoom into that horrible creature, being typed well against it. But types aren't what I'm worried about right now. You know what says screw disguise? Destiny Bond. Yeah, that's by far the best way to deal with that stupid thing. Double KO, no cheating shift mode mind reading, so I go into my very weak Hariyama, to which Kane gets to respond with his Meowstic, which takes up the role of Knight. It's not a total sacrifice though. Fakeout does tremendous damage to the Psychic type, especially since it is boosted on chessboard. After the expected mop up, I send out my Meowstic, becoming a Bishop. Mine is now six levels beyond Kane's shiny doppelganger. And after a fake out, I indeed outspeed Purple Meowstick to kill with Shadow Ball. Guess who's its Primarina? Once again, this is not a team that deals well with Primarina. It's out to Jump Luff to attempt the previous attempt's play. That goes horribly when Jump Luff misses the Sleep Powder and Primarina does not miss the Blizzard. Well, it must be Vanillix now, who is my king still, hell yes he is. But that doesn't actually do very much for me since Freeze Dry is farther from killing than last time. Moonblast hits him in the face and he kills on the following turn. Alolan Marowak is returning to the game, maybe to push over the table again. So I go into Mawile for the boosted Sucker Punch. But against the Marowrook, a Sucker Punch, even from my Queen Mawile, is not enough to kill? Why was it that far off? Mawile is then devastated with a Flare Blitz, taking another chunk off of Marowak from Recoil. Down to two now, and my choices are pretty poor. Vanillix has the king priority, so he can knock over the Marowak. Unless it drinks Moo Moo Milk. I went for Blizzard, and I thought I'd kill anyway, but it survives it. It's fine though. It's within range to die on the next one. Of course! It's a Legend of Zelda bottle of milk! Two uses! This is really bad now. Marowak has all the health it needs to take another blizzard and return literal fire. I decide that Meowstic may have a chance to survive the fire attack better. Can you Shadow Bone against the Ice type? And Meowstic fainted. Well, might as well throw the blizzard and hope for the freeze! And no thaw! That means Kane did Shadow Bone again even though Flare Blitz would have defrosted it! I hit Marowak with what is the fourth blizzard it took to finally put an end to it. But just then, the hail stops. Without hail, Blizzard reverts to its poor accuracy. Nidoking is here, and it will kill me when it gets the chance. But Vanillix has king priority. It all comes down to this. Blizzard. 70% accuracy. The. Clutch. Master. Get out of here, Kane. I'd complain more about this fight, and especially this field, but I get the feeling that future fights on chessboard are going to more than overshadow this one. Kane then reads my mind and says it for me. Fuck your field effect, Radimus. He doesn't say it like that. The point is, I'm never going to know what's going on in a chess battle. With the battle over though, Luna enters the room alarmed. Gardevoir is missing. And when Luna investigates the foyer, she returns with a note from an unknown messenger in a light robe. The message is brief and blunt. Gossip Gardevoir has been abducted by L. He will free her if Radimus turns Luna over to him. Luna protests again of L being her father, begging Radimus not to consign her to him. As for Gardevoir, both Luna and Kane wish to save her, though when they ask what they should do to rescue her, 
Radimus simply replies, nothing. He claims that, despite his caring about her, he doesn't need to do anything to save her. Kane doesn't like Radimus's laissez-faire attitude and leaves to pursue Elle somehow, to which Luna tries to follow. However, Radimus warns Luna that this is what Elle wants her to do, thus putting herself in danger. Instead, he changes his mind, and also his hat, and agrees to help. Wait, that's not your only hat? Then, was it you, At? Detective Radimus proceeds on his way, meeting Kane in the foyer. Kane mentions the new hat, to which Radimus explains that he chooses the right hat for the job. He goes on to clarify that this is not for Gardevoir's sake, but Luna's. After Radimus makes a couple musings that invoke the game of chess again, Kane exasperatedly asks us to get a move on. To this, Radimus suggests we head for Reborn City, where Elle was known to operate. That's really not that precise of a direction. The two leave, and so do we, heading back over Route 1, which, coming from Van Hainen Castle, requires no Tauros to reach the Reborn Gates. On the way back, though, let's stop in at the Nature Center and catch up on the news. Our favorite abducted Pokémon journalist first talks about the occurrence at Tanzan Mountain last episode, informing viewers of the now-exploded meteor base that was there. As for the interview and rundown channels, today seems to be the crossover episode. Gardevoir is interviewing DJ Arclight, who makes it clear that music is his life. He reminds everyone that the best way to see him dropping his beats at the nightclub is to beat the Elite Four. Working on it, Arclight. As I alluded to already, the DJ then opens his show with a look into the Gardevoir's master, Radimus. The DJ, like Kane, comments on Radimus's penchant for bizarre hats and explains that Radimus amassed wealth by being a grandmaster at chess, enough to live in a castle we just left. If it wasn't the most obvious thing in the world, Radimus's ace is Gossip Gardevoir, showing that her quick wit isn't her only power. Oh, hell no it isn't. After a quick jaunt to the south, we reach and enter this enclosed space behind the Grand Gates, immediately spotting L. That's convenient, as we follow him to the left. As soon as we enter, Kane and Radimus quickly join us, but L is nowhere to be found. Kane and I squeeze by the large gear on the floor, as Radimus mutters it will be harder for an adult to do this. Okay, so again, are we an adult or not? Radimus gets stuck halfway, as Kane asks why this gear is stuck like this. Radimus explains it is connected to the Grand Gates, and since they were frozen, this clockwork has also ceased to move. Kane then drops an innuendo to motivate Radimus, who proceeds to bullrush Kane off of a cliff. Okay, he didn't mean to, but Kane has fallen into the darkness below, which Radimus assures isn't very far. We jump down together, landing in a part of the Crystal Cavern. Nearby, Radimus tells us that Kane isn't around, and we start to search for him and Gardevoir. I want to mention that this area has a shit ton of star pieces. I won't be showing all of them, but definitely hit your item finder button especially often in here. As soon as you descend deeper, you'll quickly recognize the caverns we spelunked in episode 4. We now get to walk around the areas that were out of reach from before. It's fairly straightforward. On the way, you'll also see some more mining rocks, as well as this large, sealed door. Ominous. Walk north from this door and enter the next room. What just happened? In this crystal cave, we find something truly otherworldly. A place called the Cité Astra. We are immediately met by a person named Uhu, who appears to have Gardevoir beside them. They tell us that an older man just passed by and explained the situation to them. What, pray tell, did he say? That we kidnapped and brainwashed his daughter. Well, that throws L off the cool list. Unfortunately for us, this person has fully accepted this story and goes on to ask Radimus what he has been doing to Gardevoir. This naturally befuddles Radimus, and the mystery person tells us that Gardevoir cares not for Radimus at all to which the Pokémon beside them confirms it, saying she was too scared to do anything. She then asks for the protection of the silver-haired person, Adrian. Adrian wholeheartedly agrees to safeguard her. But to this, Radimus completely blows off their explanation. 
Kane is confused how this is possible with how she was acting earlier, but she reveals it was all a show, and continues to badmouth Radimus going so far as to be a witness to Radimus brainwashing Luna. Adrian is taken by this, and affirms their desire to retrieve Elle's daughter and stolen property. Stolen property? What's that about? That's when Gardevoir rushes forward and snatches the Amethyst Pendant. She attempts to steal the Ruby Ring too, claiming they are both Elves, but Kane forces her back. Upon hearing Amethyst Pendant though, Radimus perks up. Gardevoir relents, saying they only need one of the keys to advance to the Aerie. She leaves as Adrian coolly delivers an ultimatum to return Luna to El and follows her. Kane expresses his confusion on all of this, as he then presses Radimus on the idea of him brainwashing Luna. Radimus belittles the intelligence behind the accusation, seemingly unperturbed by the events that we just witnessed. The two press onward towards the structure ahead. Throughout this scene, you've been listening to one of my favorite tracks in the game. Glitch X City's remix of the Ice Path theme from Gold and Silver. I'm admittedly biased towards tracks that I can recognize from their original game, but regardless, the grandiose rendition of this moody track from Gen 2 is amazing and holds so much intensity. Rightfully so, as you'll see. Walk around the pillars in this room now and collect a lot of star pieces and this shiny stone, and also mine the mining rocks. Also, it may be wise to catch all the Pokemon you don't already have in the grass around here. For me, I caught a ball toy, which is the last of the totem pole Pokemon done. Had we gotten everything but Gallets with our ill-fated dolls, then we would probably need a third one. As well, I mined up a little Max Revive before I enter into the building before us. We catch up to Adrian and Gardevoir, when we also confront Elle. Elle's kindly facade we saw at Sarah's gym is entirely absent now as he demeans Kane for being present in this apparent holy place. Gardevoir reiterates to Kane that El is not at fault here, as El proselytizes about his Lord Arceus. He then summons Adrian and Gardevoir through an open door. Kane voices his puzzlement again, as Adrian seemingly agrees with this. They explain how they had fallen into this cavern earlier, and quickly notice both a girl climbing the cavern and El and Gardevoir arriving, followed by us. They don't elaborate further and leave. The door in which Elle and the others exited now shuts tight behind them. Radimus offers that the reason for them being able to enter that door was because of the Amethyst Pendant. By the same token, we can enter this door by possessing the Ruby Ring. This leads us into a room with three statues and an extra pedestal. The unoccupied pedestal bears a plaque that describes the puzzle in this place. To put it simply, it is a truth logic puzzle, where each of the statues will tell us whether the other statues in the room speak truth or lies, which they call light or darkness. The goal is to set the statues in the room to the correct combination based on their clues. For this first one, Chimchar says Monferno follows light, but Infernape does not. Monferno and Infernape both claim that their fellow species evolutions are draped in lies. You can pause now if you want to solve the puzzle to yourself. The answer is that only Infernape speaks the truth. The other two monkeys lie. This activates the pad to ascend. You enter into a four-pronged room with a central exit. In the bottom right, a similarly lit elevator pad colored purple sits. If you were to go through it, you'll find a similar room to what we just solved, but with the Clefairy line. Going further back shows that not one of the three who came through here cared to pick up this XL candy. What fools! Now return to the higher floor and continue on, where you are confronted by Adrian on their own. Adrian tells us that L wanted them to take the ruby ring from us to stop our pursuit, but simply asks if we will hand it over. Yeah, I think not. Kane speaks for me that they can't have the ring to which Adrian comments that they don't think we're lying about the ring and pendant. Adrian is amenable to the idea that they are not privy to all the facts. 
They say how the doors around here were impassable to them while they've been here for the past hour, but they gave way easily to the power of the jewelry. Adrian is still wary of us, but Kane insists that Elle is the one who's evil, saying he stole Gardevoir. When Adrian asks if we can prove our story, Radimus procures such proof, the ransom note from the castle. Adrian now conveys their own confusion about this, to which Kane asserts we continue ever on to find out, though Kane isn't shy to mention that it's not like he completely trusts Radimus either. In any case, have the ruby door yield to the ring once more, and enter into another truth puzzle. This time, the stakes are raised, as we encounter the Tyrogue line. Four to find out. Hitmon Lee says that Tyrogue is truthful, but Hitmon Top is not. Hitmon Chan reveals that Hitmon Lee is darkened, but Hitmon Top walks in the light. Tyrogue pins darkness upon both Hitmon Top and Hitmon Chan. Hitmon Top, spoken of by all three of its compatriots, calls Hitmon Lee a liar and Tyrogue innocent. The answer is Hitmon Top lies. Hitmon Lee is bright. Tyrogue joins him and Hitmon Chan stands in darkness. This opens the way on to the Airy, which presents us with a light shard. Use it. Walk out onto this balcony amidst the cavern, and walk south to where a mammoth door looms, Gardevoir and El standing before it. The holy man laments the truth of this place. The door before them only opens if all four keys are assembled. He then turns to Adrian and pins failure upon them, but Adrian is interested rather in answers than in El's favor. But El quickly dismisses them, and now unveils the purpose of this place. He claims that beyond the doors in front of us lie a being that creates worlds from its dreams. None other than Arceus itself. L continues by saying that Arceus, who created all Pokémon, arrived here on Earth by way of a meteor. He then curses Reborn City for its existence atop the hallowed site of the meteor impact. He then muses about what, if they collected all the keys, could they use Arceus's power for to which Radimus retorts that now L sounds like the heretic. Now comes the spoken showdown, where Radimus calls out L's farce by having Gardevoir beside him. Gardevoir continues to muddle the matter by speaking ill of the psychic gym leader, and L repeats his demand for Luna in exchange for Gardevoir. Radimus tells L that Luna does not want to be with him, but the holy man will not hear it, calling it the work of Radimus's mind control. Radimus once again deflates this idea, but Gardevoir admits to have seen it herself, saying how terrible Radimus is. Radimus shows he doesn't care what she says, which gets Kane to interject Radimus seems far too cold to her, as Adrian agrees. Radimus says simply, A Pokémon like that? Why should I care? The tables seem to turn on Radimus as the others wonder about his motivations. This leads Radimus to then ask those who met Luna and Gardevoir to judge. Cain believes that Radimus doesn't care about Gardevoir, but thinks Luna doesn't want to go back to L. Being burned by Ace, though, makes him question this, too. That's when Cain punts to us. Who do I side with? L or Radimus? Seems like a weighty decision, doesn't it? Let me put it this way. From the first time I've played this game, I have never liked L, and he's the one after the keys, so it's a simple matter. I side with Radimus. Radimus is appreciative of our trust, claiming the charade transparent as such. He asks Adrian where they get their opinion of Radimus, which is all from Gardevoir. But Radimus states that Adrian has never met Gardevoir. When Adrian points to the Pokémon standing here with us, Radimus then pushes on L. At this, L gives it up. The Gardevoir beside him is a ditto. Radimus declares that it would have been foolish to be taken in by a confession from a false Pokémon, hence why he acted so coldly to the fake Gardevoir. He states that unlike the Tower Riddles, light could blind worse than darkness. But L growls at Radimus to speak not of blindness. He says that he was once blind, and that it was Arceus who bestowed sight upon him, thus beginning his life of worship to the Pokémon. Further, he now seeks to tap into Arceus' power. He commands his ditto. Now, instead of a Gardevoir, 
The pink gum morphs again, confirming Elle's claim about this place. And now, not only are you expected to fight a level 75, it isn't a pseudo-legendary anymore. It isn't even a standard legendary. You will now face the god of Pokemon, and the highest base stat total of any non-mega Pokemon. Make no mistake, this is a fight against the power of Arceus itself. Another hell fight has arrived, and there's a huge issue. If you aren't prepared to win this fight now, there's no changing your party, unless you lose. Then, it will warp you completely out of the dungeon and back to your last heal point, which for me was Van Hanen Castle. This doesn't mean I had to do that. I would definitely not tolerate it because it does all kinds of bad things to your relationship scores. I had my strategy planned. Oh, do you think it's just Houndoom again? I realized that if all the 6v1 hell fights were done with Quick Claw Houndoom, that would be pretty boring. Instead, I decided I wanted to give Bastiodon a better showing than what happened at Sarah's gym. And it just so happens that Arceus has the perfect move to use on my sturdy Bastiodon, Focus Blast. The perfect move. I said, the perfect move. Excuse me, Arceus, haven't you read the script? It says, nail the Bastiodon with Focus Blast. Thank you. Now take this. Oh. Uh. And it has fucking leftovers, too. And reset counter. Well, now it's going to be a scramble for damage. You'll notice I don't have Houndoom, so I can't bail myself out with that. I have several priority moves. Two of them fake out. Here's Hariyama's fake out for basically nothing. Let's get him out so he can do it again with guts. I throw Greninja under the bus. And he lives on 1 HP, holy shit! With that, Greninja gets to do a water shuriken, which gets three hits to at least move the meter. But those leftovers are heinous. It's at this time that I realize I can cancel out the leftovers with Vanillix's hail, which I do. Sadly, Vanille Clutch cannot survive the god's wrath. I use Meow Stick to fake out, but that does very little. Back to Hariyama, my chances dwindling fast. A Guts fake out is not much better than before, and Hariyama can't survive to knock the leftovers away from Arceus. Last chance, Mawile, do it with Sucker Punch. Well, that would have been a hell of a feat. So here's the problem with Bastiodon. His EVs are shit for a Metal Burst build. I went full defense with him, but the crux of a Metal Burst or any counter build is high HP. I can't fix his EVs right now, but I can bump him up 10 levels. I put Vanillix up front, and once again cancel through the entire cutscene, while making sure I side with Radimus again. The second attempt starts with Vanillix being destroyed after starting a Hailstorm. Then it's out to Bastiodon, so Arceus can use the perfect for fuck's sake! Stop missing! Alright, just hit Bastiodon now! And the sturdy was broken by the hail. Arceus, damn it! Okay, Bastiodon up front like before. This time Arceus does land the fucking Focus Blast in one try. Metal Burst blasts Arceus all the way down to red before leftovers pull him back into yellow. Even though Bastiodon isn't going to do more damage, I figure it would be better to start hail immediately so leftovers can't undo more of my lead. Vanillix heroically gets judged and hail pelts Arceus. Now I go into Hariyama for a fake out. Then I save him for a Guts Fake Out by sacking Bastiodon now. Hariyama comes back to Guts Fake Out, but it's still not enough. I let him faint and know that I can finish it with Greninja. He comes out to Water Shuriken and gets one, two, three, and four to win. Whew. Even though we had a couple more attacks to use, Bastiodon leveling up was crucial. It would have been automatic had I Eevee trained him correctly but we're through yet another horrible ordeal. There's something I need to explain here. If you find that you don't have the means to take on an Arceus that is a minimum of 15 levels higher than you, then you could side with L. 
doing so allows you to lose the fight like the Garchomp and continue if you must. With Ditto Arceus fallen, Kane now asks the obvious question. Where is the real Gardevoir? Radimus has that taken care of. Gardevoir teleports at his command, and at his next command, L is put to sleep by the Pokémon's hypnosis. The man of many hats changes it again, ready to book the Holy Man. Kane now asks another obvious question. Why the hell did Radimus go on this goose chase if Gardevoir was always safe? Radimus responds because Luna asked him. Adrian now sees what we've seen all game between Gardevoir and Radimus. Must feel pretty silly now, huh? Now Radimus wishes to vacate this place and asks Gardevoir to teleport us out, though I decline. She is all too delighted to do so, though says that the strange energy of this place hinders her somewhat. Why did I decline? Because there's another Pokemon to obtain here, and coming back to this Airy later may not be possible. That Pokemon is Sigilyph. Here you are, another of my most trusted Pokemon. Sigilyph is surprisingly strong and fast, with quite an excellent move pool. Best to obtain whatever Pokemon you can before the time comes. What time? You'll learn soon. It won't be long now. Because of my decision to stay, I need to walk out of the Cite Astra myself. On my way out... A strange, childlike voice rings out with a subtle menace. Anyway, the Grand Gates are working now. After years of being non-functional, they come back to life now? We witness Adrian exit into Reborn City through these now open gates. When we join them though, they are aghast at what they see. So much so, that they have to confirm where we are. When Kane says it is Reborn City, Adrian denies this. They pace back and forth, bewildered by the sight of the grotesque city and brown lake. When Kane asks if they're new here, Adrian angrily asserts they've lived in Reborn their entire life. While this may seem crazy, Radimus loose an answer to yet another mystery. He asks them to explain what Reborn was supposed to look like to which Adrian paints a picture of a lush, forested region with a brilliantly blue lake. They say at one corner of the lake is a port with their gym. Gym. Adrian then realizes something in horror and runs off. That's when Kane realizes that Adrian just said they are a gym leader and that the gym they mean is the one in Coral Ward. We go there and find Adrian standing at the dilapidated gym we saw back in episode two. Their reaction to the sight is one of incredulity. Radimus tells Adrian that, from his point of view, this building has been this way for years. But Adrian says the opposite is true for them. The gym was fine when they left this morning. Radimus further explains that, when Reborn was rebuilt after its first destruction, that this gym, along with other buildings, were to remain as they were for historical purposes. But Adrian is completely unaware of such events that destroyed Reborn, and this is when Radimus lays out his theory. Adrian, who believed they had just left this morning and was in the Cite Astra for an hour, was frozen in time. Radimus goes on to inquire how Adrian reached it, and they say it was because they went to investigate a light shining through the floor of the Grand Gates. They did so, saying the Grand Gates were operational. Radimus tells them they haven't been for years. This goes back to El's proclamation of Arceus's presence in the Cite Astra. Radimus believing the power there may have warped time. When Adrian asks why we weren't affected, Radimus offers that it was because we had two of the keys to that place and freed Adrian from stasis. Adrian doesn't decline to believe this theory, but is no happier because of it. However, they resolve not to leave this place in the state it's in. Gardevoir wonders aloud how they'll fix their gym. Adrian didn't mean the gym. They meant the entire city. <sighs> Adrian knows the Herculean task they just spoke, but says they will do anything to bring Reborn City back to the way it used to be, no matter how small. On this matter, Adrian learns that they should meet with Ame at the Grand Hall, and gives us thanks for ostensibly saving them. With Adrian gone, 
Radimus turns his attention back to our gym challenge, finally. And we are given the option to fast travel back to Van Hanen. Oh, this time I will take that. Returning to the castle, Luna is joyful to see Gardevoir safe and thanks Radimus for his heroism. Nice Gallade hat. Nice top hat. At this moment, Radimus then announces an introduction. Into the castle walks... L? No. Radimus introduces this man as his new butler, Elias. Elias. Who comes forward and kindly tells us he is at our service. So, Radimus, let's talk about that brainwashing again. Luna, naturally, is upset, but when Kane tries to explain to Radimus that this is Luna's father, she is also upset by that. Radimus then asks Elias to confirm if he is Luna's father. He denies it. This still doesn't give Luna comfort, who leaves. Radimus, meanwhile, asks Elias if he was in possession of a rare item. Elias confirms and hands over the Amethyst Pendant. Kane exclaims that is Anna's pendant, to which Radimus then inquires to me how I obtained it, then speaking one of my favorite fourth wall break lines in the whole game. He then asks Kane the same question, who explains that it belonged to one of our friends. Radimus understands the pain of losing a precious item, but then asks us to put faith in him when he says he won't give it back to us. He then invites us to proceed into the gym to begin our challenge against him, and leaves like that. Kane, understandably, is wondering if trusting Radimus was the play. I'm with you on this one, Kane. The word of the day is weird. But now, we must go from weirdness to suffering. Coming up now is the Psychic Gym, which boasts the combination of one of the most vicious gym fights and perplexing gym puzzles in the entire game. No time like the present, let's just get it over with. Step through the now open door in the next room and be immediately presented with this sight. A massive chessboard with suitably sized pieces waits, as Radimus and Gardevoir explain the puzzle of the gym. The board before you contains a chess puzzle, where you, playing white, must checkmate black. But you do not have to play against black per se. You are allowed to move your pieces infinitely, within their respective movement limitations, and Black's pieces may never move. However, you cannot capture any pieces. The objective is to form a checkmate board from the starting position you are given, adhering to the movement rules of chess while doing so. You can also not end in a position where your own king is in check. Also, I'm sorry if you don't know how chess works, and I'm prattling on with all these chess terms. I'm going to assume you do understand, but don't worry too much about it if you don't. Of course, you could also click on this silver shard here, and skip all of this puzzle. Anyway, let's get into the first one. This one is pretty easy, and is a good warm-up for how this works. You have a king and a rook, and they only have a king. Push your rook north to be on the same row as the black king, and move your king below theirs to threaten the squares south of them. Talk to Radimus to complete the puzzle. Upon doing so though, a gym trainer suddenly appears. You'll also need to battle them to proceed. Before we do that though, we skipped a couple things. First, talk to Ame back here, who tells you that Radimus uses doubles format! And even worse than that, he's a trick rumor! For the unaware, trick room changes the game for, in chessboard's case, eight turns to allow the slowest Pokemon to act first. It will utterly crush teams who spent all their time getting fast to sweep, much like the one I have. It is a move you end up getting well familiar with, especially against you. She goes on to advise you to be mindful of your chessboard team configuration. I've gone into that already, but if you walk into the room to the left, you'll find a computer that will tell you what your teammates will become on chessboards, specifically in doubles format, meaning you'll have two pawns. The rest of this room explains the movement mechanics of the different chess pieces, in order to quickly teach non-chess players the relevant rules. At the far end of the room, you'll find Elias standing next to a psychic memory. Talking to Elias, he will answer your questions. Most of them are about the rules of chess. You can also ask him about himself, to which he replies with humbleness about his lowly life. He goes on to say though how he had been a blind man most of his life, and it is Radimus who restored his sight. This whole thing making you uneasy too? Whatever, let's get back to the gym puzzle and trainers. The trainers aren't very hard at all, 
but their battles explain some nuances of the chessboard. This first trainer shows how, if you had only one Pokemon, that Pokemon becomes a queen, not a pawn. Your team will always have a queen. We move into the next room, where we're faced with a much more daunting puzzle. However, it is not that bad considering we can only move three pieces. What I like to do is to use the piece that covers the most of the king's possible squares. That would be the rook, who I can push up to the top row, which checks the king and the two squares to his sides. Make sure the rook can't be captured by the queen to the left. This leaves the three squares to the south of the king. We have a bishop, who can only move diagonally on the black squares. That means we can't cover more than just the single square directly south of the king. So that leaves this knight, who, allowing for the idea that a knight can reach any square on the board given enough turns, can move to any space like a queen would. The knight will have to cover these two squares from one place. A knight makes a move in an L shape. So if we look for a square that he can jump to both of these squares, we'll determine this to be the perfect spot, thus solving the puzzle. Now a second trainer appears, one who has only two Pokemon. This trainer shows you the mechanic of the pawn, having Sturdy for free. I show him my counter to his Meowstic by using my own Meowstic to fake him out, wasting his first turn and his Sturdy while keeping mine in play. I beat his male and female Meowsticks without trouble. Three Meowsticks in one fight, that's weird. Make your way into the next room for an even more complicated puzzle. You're now given a lot of pieces to work with, but Luna gives you the hint to think about infinite potential. What she means is to remember the rule about pawns. A pawn is only allowed to normally move towards their opponent's side of the board without changing columns. If a pawn is able to reach the opposite side of the board, then the pawn is promoted into any other piece besides a king. So from this board, we see that of all the pawns we have, only this one can reach the other side unimpeded. This allows us to promote it, but into what? A queen? The best piece? You may think so, but look at their king. It's completely guarded by other pieces. We can't take them under the puzzle's rules, so a queen can't put the king in check. But the piece that can is a knight. The other thing a knight can do is jump over other pieces, so it can reach the king. We only have one knight, but we can promote our persevering pawn into another knight and stand them side by side two squares below the king. You may think that the rook or queen ruins this plan by capturing the right side knight, but the left one already has the king in check, and none of black's pieces can capture it. That leaves the king with one move, to the left, where it is checked by the other knight. Checkmate. Into the third trainer battle, which pits us against three Pokemon now to demonstrate the power of the King and its boosted priority. A Beldum Pawn falls easily thanks to Fake Out, when we are faced with their King, Metagross. Metagross, a pseudo-legendary on a regular gym trainer. I send out Houndoom to it, believing it to be a good matchup for it offensively and defensively. Seems to be true, as Metagross goes first with its priority to Thunder Punch, but doesn't kill as Houndoom flamethrowers it out. Cool, so Houndoom will be really good against a Metagross, should we encounter another here. Last is the remaining member of the Beldum line, Matang, who is no match for another flamethrower. This opens the way into the final puzzle, one that is trickier than the rest for a different reason. Once again, you're given relatively few pieces to work with. Your king is deadlocked by pieces on all sides, none of which can actually capture it. This leaves you with two knights, a bishop, and a pawn. The enemy king has five spaces to work with on the top right corner of the board. First, our bishop can move to put it in check and cut off one of the other four squares. However, two knights stacked three squares to the king's left gives him one out to the very top right square. Well, we have a pawn that has a pathway to promotion, and it will promote on a black square. The top right square is also black, so the pawn will promote into a bishop. Let's move both of the bishops next to each other, cutting off both diagonals and leaving the king with only one space, the white space to its northwest. For that, we put our knight into this crook, and we're done. Or so you'd think. You see, there's one thing we neglected. Our own king is in check by their queen. Go move our extra knight into the line of the queen's fire to keep our king safe. Puzzle complete. This leads us into the final trainer, 
who now puts all of the pieces together. Not to say they're very difficult, they use an unknown for their pawn, king, and queen. The pawn is a simple matter with fake out. They use a rook wabafit, who I luckily play around its first counter, then don't kill it when it went for destiny bond, quick claw. I need to hold back the kill, so I use foul play a second time, quick claw, dodging its mirror coat. Then I kill it before it uses destiny bond again. Dicey, but we're good. Houndoom stays out to knock down the behem, quick claw! Three quick claws! Where were all those for the Metacham? Anyway, Houndoom takes out the following Swoobat as Meowstic returns to end both of the Royal Unknowns with ease. So now we have passed the gym's puzzle and their defending trainers. The fun and games are over. One of the gym battles I dread the most is about to begin. Let me show you the team I've assembled for the suffering to follow. First, as the preceding gym trainer fights demonstrated, Meowstic is going to be a stellar pawn. Having a boosted fake out to break other pawns will be super nice, even though in doubles I won't have a fake out for both sides. Besides that, she has boosted psychic, shadow ball to actually hit weakness, and light clay light screen in case setup becomes more important. Speaking of setup, next we have Cricketoon, who will be my other pawn. The Master of Fury is finally back for another showing, and hopefully his new moveset will shine. He's got Sticky Web as the critical setup move. Well, that's what I wish I could say, but then I remembered. Ame told us that Radimus is going to employ Trick Room. I know all about that. I was predominantly a Trick Roomer in my last file, which may in hindsight have contributed to a lot of my pain. For right now, though, Radimus's team is going to eat most of my team alive with how fast my teammates are on average. If Trick Room doesn't serve him, though, Sticky Web will further hobble him. After that, Cricketune can use Technician Fellstinger to optimally bring down an opponent for a triple attack stage. His only flaw is the fact that the move Psychic hits with a rock secondary type, so he's very open to pain. In that same vein, next is Vanillix, who has the lowest HP of the teammates I'm bringing who aren't in overriding roles, so he's going to be my king like in the Kane fight. In truth, he's kind of strange to bring, what with being neutral to Psychic while Psychic the move will probably crush him. But I'm stubborn, and the allure of Priority Blizzard that can't miss is too strong for me to ignore. Following him is another neutral choice, Greninja. Now Greninja is one I'm not too sure about, but Protean may have the chance to flex his utility in the fight with Radimus. I can match his type to resist damage, use Water Shuriken to be neutral and clean up with Priority, and use Smokescreen if I get desperate. After that, we have the other Pokemon that tore up the gym trainers, Houndoom. No surprise here, he's wicked fast, is immune to the Psychic type, and holding a Dread Plate for his Dark type moves. I could potentially put him as my Queen instead, but he's a Bishop for now, which is just fine. As for my actual Queen, that's Mawile. She has far less HP than any of my other Pokemon, but a boosted Sucker Punch in the Queen slot has scary amounts of potential in a Psychic gym. Plus, she resists Psychic and will get the defense boost from being Queen, helping her otherwise frailty. That's what I've got for Radimus, but there's absolutely no sense in being very confident. Trust me, Radimus is in all likelihood going to rip me to shreds worse than Kiki. He's got it all, a ridiculously powerful team, the doubles format, and one of the worst killing fields in the game. If all else fails, we'll have to bring in Primeape to tip over the table, but let's hope we don't have to stoop that low. It's time. The fight for the 8th badge begins. Meowstic and Cricketune face Radimus's frontline pawns, Malamar and Reuniclus. That double weakness to bug on Malamar is looking especially juicy, so I fake out and fell Stinger on the Topsy Turvy Pokemon. This essentially gives me a 50% chance that I interrupt Trick Room, since it would be foolish for both of his team to use it. Executing the play as such, I do kill the Malamar with ease, but a couple wrinkles emerge. First, it's got a rocky helmet so we both get hurt doing this, removing our sturdy as well. Secondly, I did win the coin flip to not see Trick Room, 
This, unfortunately, was because Reuniclus was aiming a psychic right at Krikatoon's face. And with no sturdy, the extra rock type crushes my bug under a chess piece. To replace Krikatoon with no trick room up, I go into Houndoom, who should be plenty fast. Hey look, it's a Metagross King, just like before. Think Houndoom will do well against it? No. Houndoom's speed means nothing to the priority pseudo-legendary, who picks up another chess piece with strength and slams it over Houndoom's head. Meowstic's Shadow Ball does not quite half to the Metagross, but the Reuniclus activates Trick Room, plunging us into hell. I need priority of my own, and the best choice is to move my Queen Mawile into position. She has Sucker Punch, and it's likely that she's slower than Metagross, so she'll benefit off the Trick Room first. Not only does she get to go first as I hoped, but she also kills the Metagross. That went down a lot easier than I would have expected. Meanwhile, Reuniclus and Meowstic trade large hits, Meowstic taking more damage and going to red. Up next though is something that, in a Trick Room, is the King of Slow. Slow King. Come on, the video's almost over, don't leave now. The only recourse to a Slow King going first in a Trick Room is my Sucker Punch, which targets Reuniclus, while Meowstic will lob another Shadow Ball at King Slow. Sucker Punch decks the Reuniclus down, but Meowstic naturally gets no chance to attack before Slow King scalds her. Now Radimus sends his star-studded ace, Miss Gossip Gardevoir herself, as I send in Vanillix. This was to freeze-dry the Slow King since Vanillix is my king, and will out Radimus, but now that Gardevoir is here I decide I need to go for Blizzard. I keep Mawile sucker punching, against Slow King of course since he's weak to it. However, it plus Blizzard doesn't kill Slow King, and does poor damage to Gossip with her stage of special defense. What's worse is that Slow King's Psychic shatters Vanillix in a single hit, while Gardevoir's own powered-up Psychic does half to Mawile. My chances have basically died in this attempt, as I send my last reserve, Greninja, who being a bishop with a priority move would appear to have a chance to make something cool happen. But though we can go first to shuriken the TV star after sucker punching Slow King's lights out finally, the damage just isn't there. Gardevoir reminds me how unbelievably powerful she is by using one Moonblast, which Greninja just stopped being weak to, and Greninja is knocked out. It's one against two, and last is... How fitting. It's too bad the Gallade wasn't king, but why not use a Metagross on badge 8? Neither one of these two branches of the Ralts line are weak to Sucker Punch, so I just throw a play rough at Gallade. Oh wait, it went first! Tch, thanks 10% mischance! What a travesty. I need more information before I can make changes. The second attempt, I see what happens if I instead try to kill the Reuniclus instead, so that Krikatoon would live another turn. However, while Malamar dying to a bug move is a foregone conclusion, the Reuniclus does not die to 75 power Felstinger. The fake out flinch lets Krikatoon stay alive, but Malamar does twist the dimensions. Next turn, though both of his Pokémon strike first and deal major damage to us with Psychic and Throat Chop, Krikatoon lives with his Sturdy while Meowstic just lives. Krikatoon's Felstinger easily plinks the Reuniclus, while Shadow Ball does not so much to the Malamar. I could have reversed it for better overall damage, but Malamar's Sturdy would keep it from dying and his Rocky Helmet would kill Krikatoon. Slow King's back, and both of his side are slower than mine. Not a single chance to make a move there. I have to use Mawile already, and I have Vanillix accompany her to seize back the first moves. I focus down the Slow King immediately with Sucker Punch and Freeze Dry, which does the job. Malamar then pulls out the superpower to smash into Vanillix, which at first is odd to me. I'm pretty sure the Rock type on Psychic would have killed there, but Vanillix instead lives the superpower, clutch as he is. But it's probably because this Malamar has Contrary. Oh great. Now the pseudo has come back to put me in check. I hit it with the ever first sucker punch and a crit almost kills. This allows the Metagross, who for some reason is naturally slower than Vanillix, to go before him and rub salt in the wound with an ice punch to KO. But Vanillix drags the pseudo down with him with the continuing hail, as Malamar hits for a little damage with Rock Slide. There it is again, every gym. Next out is Greninja, who is back to facing a similar field as before. What is he supposed to do here? To reprise her role of the last attempt, 
Gardevoir returns, and by the way, she traces sheer force while knowing Psychic and Moonblast. Okay. Mawile just sucker punches the journalist, and Greninja gets a feeble two hit of Water Shuriken before being superpowered and moonblasted from existence. Oh, and Gardevoir has a Citrus Berry. Cool, nice, thanks. Anyway, it's down to my last Pokemon, who is in the worst spot imaginable Houndoom. I go impotently for Sucker Punch on the Gardevoir, who answers with a moonblast to fell Mawile. Malamar's increased attack makes the Rock Sight it gets to use first against Houndoom a sure kill. No miss for me. Okay, Greninja is not fitting into this fight, and we really can't have any dead slots. For that purpose, I tag in Bastiodon instead. He can easily muscle in on the Trick Room bullshit, and has a type that will gravely injure the Gardevoir. Not sure if he'll do much better than he did at Sarah's gym, but he's better than Greninja in this case. One thing to note, though, is that this causes Bastiodon to usurp the King's Crown from Vanillux, making the Ice Cream into a bishop instead. I didn't realize this at first, and it has an unfortunate side effect. Metal Burst is almost completely useless if it has priority. This team change doesn't really do a whole lot for my confidence, if I'm being honest. Attempt 3, I replay Attempt 1 by killing the Malamar immediately which causes Krikatoon to go down to Psychic. While there's no Trick Room, I send out Houndoom, and you know the definition of insanity, right? Yeah, Metagross comes out and does the exact same thing. Very bad play. Shadow Ball takes 40% from Reuniclus, but Trick Room is online again. I put Mawile into play again for Metagross, since she's the only one who can go before Metagross now. But as before, a crit sucker punch thank you Razor Claw doesn't kill Metagross, but his Meteor Mash missed. After Meowstic eats a bishop-shaped statue from Psychic, she launches a Shadow Ball at King Metagross to overthrow him. But another king rises once again. Slow King. Radimus and I take the next turn to knock out one Pokemon each before the other acts. Reuniclus and Meowstic removed from the board. Now I put in Vanillix. At this moment, I did not notice that Vanillix got these boosts since Bastiodon was king now. The Gossip Queen steps in again. I try to focus down Slow King like last time, but I discover the role change on Vanillix when Slow King outspeeds for Psychic to one-shot him. Once again, I'm far behind, as I send in my new player, Bastiodon. With his newfound priority-ness, he ironheads the Gardevoir but that does a disappointing amount of damage, only bringing her below half before she eats her berry to basically invalidate the turn. Mawile is able to punch out the Slow King before he acted, but Radimus's queen then blasts my queen. The green-haired couple retake the stage, as I realize something terrible. Vanillix's hail has hurt Bastiodon, disengaging his sturdy, and he's all I have left. Chalk up another defeat at the hands of a close combat. Okay, Hale and Bastiodon do not mix, and Vanillux is not pulling his weight this time. Other than the Slow King, he's poorly suited to fight anything, and since they all have Rocky Road Psychic, he's too easy to kill. This is unfortunately also the case for Krikatoon and Houndoom, but they at least have some ways to hurt the opposition. For this reason, I have to drop out Vanillux and put someone else in. However, I'm annoyed to do this a second time because I really don't have many good Pokemon ready to replace him. I think about using Heracross already, but he'd be barely different since he's weak to this gym. I contemplate using Jumpluff to start the fight because he can outspeed either opponent and put them to sleep while Meowstic fakes out the other one. Next turn, I can put the second one to sleep. However, I quickly change my mind on this because Reuniclus gets a magic coat from a seed. I decide I have to just go with someone who can lean into Trick Room strats. Camerupt. He's really not amazing here, since Rock Slide is the only thing that hurts only Radimus' side and it wouldn't do that much. Lava Plume and Earthquake, though strong, hurt my side badly, especially Mawile. It's all I can think of doing though, as I start to get that nervousness that it will either take extreme luck or extreme grinding to surpass Radimus. In we go for Attempt 4. I decide to try something else this time. Malamar is the one trick rooming every time, so I fake him out. But I won't kill him with Krikatoon immediately. Instead, I slap the Reuniclus to break his sturdy, who then smashes Krikatoon with Psychic, but he lives it with his own pawn power. On the next turn, thanks to no trick room, 
Krikatoon can now kill the Malamar, who should go for twisting the dimensions again, while Miastic should be able to finish off Reuniclus before it acts. This will still cost me Krikatoon because of the rocky helmet, but now there's no trick room, and I'm ahead one. To this board, Radimus sends Gallade and Metagross, while I send Mawile. But this is when the strategy to keep away the Trick Room falls apart. Whereas before, Mawile could sucker punch the Metagross under Trick Room, this time, because he's naturally faster and has the same priority as Sucker Punch, he Meteor Mashes Mawile for half her HP and her Sucker Punch fails. Extremely bad turn of events, as Shadow Ball only does half to Metagross and Gallade's knockoff, there it is, swipes aside Meowstic. For the third time, I send a Houndoom into a priority Metagross, and for the third time, Metagross stomps it. He's really not doing anything here. As for Mawile, without Trick Room, she actually suffers greatly, being outsped and fire punched down by Gallade. You know who also suffers greatly without Trick Room? My last two Pokémon, Camerupt and Bastiodon. Beside that, Bastiodon is really crippled here as his Metal Burst having priority makes it worthless, as he's then clobbered by a close combat down to 1 HP afterwards. Camerupt takes a big Zen headbutt, but survives to then go last and Lava Plume everything. This kills my Bastiodon, of course, but also the Metagross and even taking Gallade all the way down to red. But it's all for naught. Gossip Gardevoir and her Shining Gallade Knight would run Camerupt through, to which I say, F12. Attempt number 5. I decide to go back to what I did in attempt 2. This leaves Reuniclus with a sliver while Malamar puts up Trick Room. Krikatoon survives the following Psychic with Sturdy, while Meowstic stands tall after a devastating throat chop, holding on by her raw defense. Krikatoon stings the Reuniclus for 3 attack stages, and Meowstic removes the squid's Sturdy. But you can't get slower than Slowking and both of my Pokémon are easily discarded by Radimus' side. Now that Trick Room is up, I send in Mawile and Camerupt, and we find out who is faster. The Camel? Or the... Pink King Water Animal Thing? The Camel. Unfortunately, that's a bad thing, and Slow King decimates Camerupt with Scald. But then, in a very strange twist, pun very much intended, Malamar uses Trick Room again. Why did it do that? It didn't like Camerupt using it? In any case, this finally gives Houndoom an opening with no Metagross around, though after losing Camerupt, I'm so far behind again. Sucker Punch would have surely killed the Slow King, but it fails. Houndoom finally gets to attack in this fight, shooting Flamethrower at Malamar and actually killing it. Then we find out what status move Slow King used. As you might have guessed, it was Trick Room again. Now we're back to Houndoom being completely outmatched as Metagross hits the field again. Fool me thrice, I am surely a fool, but I won't get fooled again. I swap Houndoom into Bastiodon as Mawile sucker punches the Metagross hard and Bastiodon takes Metagross's attack way better than Houndoom. Whichever Pokemon I sucker punch next will die which after deliberating it a couple times ends up being Slow King, while Bastiodon will Ironhead the Metagross. That predictably does a tiny amount, while Sucker Punch knocks out Slow King. But while the Iron Head damage was poor, the flinch was huge. That clean turn leads Radimus to send out Gallade. It's unfortunate that my Sturdy on Bastiodon is gone, so we'll have to settle for a priority Iron Head. Mawile has one final Sucker Punch that will hit a weakness this fight, and a pseudo-legendary with half health to use it on. Oh by the way, I then idiotically use Metal Burst, wasting Bastiodon's last attack. Sure, let's just throw the fight. Metagross does collapse from the Sucker Punch, and Bastiodon is pummeled out by close combat. Houndoom joins my Mawile as we once again face the Ralts line final forms. For the first time in these attempts, I then go for Iron Head from Mawile against Gardevoir, while Houndoom will probably be fodder to the fighting Psychic type. It is only now that it fucking hits me as the Iron Head hits Gardevoir in the face. Trick Room makes Mawile faster than both, and the Iron Head takes down Gossip Gardevoir in one hit. Houndoom did what he does best in this fight, getting hit by a big stone chest piece and dying. But I have reduced Radimus to one Pokemon, the Gallade who has shown he has a move that can kill Mawile. But Trick Room is still up, and Mawile just showed she out low speeds the Gallade. That means we have the chance. Now please play rough. Just 
don't miss. Yes! Oh my god, fuck you, Radimus. It's finally over. And less attempts than Kiki, surprisingly, but this was not a replicable fight. The flinch against Metagross and the strange occurrence with Malamar and Slowking unnecessarily flipping dimensions, things like that make this fight so much harder. Because it shows you a pathway, then you wait attempt after agonizing attempt for them to happen again. In the end, I have no idea what the best approach was for the start of the fight, from where the entire complexion of the battle stems. Stopping Trick Room honestly hurt more than helped, but fighting into it is excruciating. The unmistakable MVP of this fight, though, was Mawile. I cannot believe what she is doing already. In this final attempt, she knocked out four of Radimus's Pokémon, almost entirely on her own, while making a complete mockery of his Trick Room. Without her, I cannot imagine what this fight would have been like. Good thing I don't have to imagine, because I can just pull up this screenshot of my last file's victory over Radimus, and I can tell you, it was fucking misery. It's pretty obvious that I was dead set on using the same team for everything with very few exceptions. Meowstic, Houndoom, and Camerupt saw another victory against Radimus today, and though Dusclops is appropriately typed, he's not meant to directly fight a sweeper team like Radimus. Blastoise, though he was the only one left standing, has nowhere comfortable to stand in this fight, and Luxray would only be good against Slowking. Radimus is definitely one of the hardest gym leaders. If nothing else, at least for his position in the game, that can be blamed almost fully on chessboard. That killing field is not for you to exploit better than your opponents. At least we will not see it again for a very long time, but we will see it again. And then... Hell. For achieving a checkmate on Radimus, we received the Millennium Badge, raising our level cap to 65. He also gives us the very move that caused us so much grief, Trick Room. It goes without saying that having this option to deal with the insurmountable speed of some Pokémon will be indispensable, as well as being able to counter bullshit that Radimus just pulled. Kane and Luna congratulate us, Luna going on to say that she is excited to battle us as well. She mentions that she would like to do so at a place called Iolia Valley, in which she can exercise her own type to its utmost. Dark. Despite the dramatic timing, no one in this room staged this blackout, and the others exit to find out what happened. We will soon learn that in order to achieve our goals, we must fight against all, darkness and light, and everything in between.